With this session update, I'm Shannon Lurkey. Leaders of the Senate DFL caucus called a virtual press conference to outline their priorities for the 2021 legislative session. Here's that media event. Good morning, everyone. I'm Susan Kent, the Senate DFL leader. Before we get started on the subject, I want to point something out. I want to welcome Jamie, our ASL interpreter. And I believe this is the first time that the Senate DFL has had an ASL interpreter for a press conference. And this is a moment worth noting. It's important that we do this, and I'm, I'm glad we are. So um, welcome, Jamie. And as a result, we will be in gallery view for everybody so that, um, so that she's visible to do her important work. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. I am excited to be here this morning to present the Senate DFL priorities for the 2021 session. These priorities represent Minnesota's shared values and demonstrate how, working together, we can build a better future for all Minnesotans and create real positive change in people's lives. Paul Wellstone said that politics are about the improvement of people's lives. We agree. And the Senate DFL enthusiastically embraces that challenge. We offer a clear vision of a better Minnesota for all to improve people's lives while protecting their basic fundamental rights. Our vision includes supporting working families, investing in our students and schools, providing a clean future, and protecting and advancing our democracy. So far this session, we've seen Senate Republicans pushing a legislative agenda that does not support all Minnesotans. This year, Senate Republicans have advanced legislation that would restrict voter access, discriminate against a group of our students, and ignore safety measures in reopening schools and businesses. They've fought against environmental guidelines that would make our state cleaner and healthier. And then they threatened to remove a sitting commissioner, again, if they didn't get their way. Republicans won't even affirm that our elections are free and fair, a cornerstone of our democracy, by enabling lies and conspiracy theories that question our very election integrity. They put our democracy at risk and the security that comes with it. Instead of working together to improve the lives of Minnesotans, Senate Republicans continue to try to divide us for political purposes. This does not represent Minnesota's shared values. It is not who we are. We have faced unprecedented challenges over the last year, from a global pandemic to our struggle with racial injustice. Instead of addressing the problems at hand and working together to find common ground, they choose to play partisan politics. Instead of bringing real solutions to address the pandemic while keeping Minnesotans safe, they spend their energy criticizing the governor and trying to find ways to tie his hands during an historic emergency. Minnesotans deserve better than partisan politics during a time of crisis. They deserve the leadership that the Senate DFL can provide with proposals that will improve the lives of Minnesotans across the state. The Senate DFL is committed to working together to build the state all Minnesotans deserve, including opportunities and protections for all at home, at work, at school, in their environment, and at the ballot box. We want our families to be healthy and secure our students to be supported to succeed, and a robust and prosperous workforce. We will also work for a clean environment and for a strong democracy so that our children can thrive in Minnesota for years to come. I am pleased to be joined by my colleagues today who will each give a brief overview of these priorities. I will first turn it over to Senate, Senator Lindsay Port. Thank you, Leader Kent. I'm Senator Lindsay Port, and I'm here to talk about how every community across Minnesota deserves the opportunity to not just survive, but to thrive. I was talking with a mom from my district, and she was telling me about the pressure and loneliness she's felt while balancing caring for her small children and trying to be successful at her job. How she didn't have help from her family because they were trying to keep her parents safe from the pandemic, and she didn't have access to paid leave from her job to be fully present with her kids. She wasn't asking for a perfect solution, just a little help to make this all easier. As we all recover from the devastating effects of a global pandemic, we need to support Minnesotans in their homes and their workplaces to help them stay connected and succeed. We also recognize that birth, from birth through aging, everyone should have access to affordable healthcare, safe and affordable housing, and economic security. In Minnesota, we care about each other and our families, and believe the Minnesotans should not have to choose between taking care of themselves or a loved one and a paycheck. We all do better when everyone has the tools they need 
to live a joyful life and work with dignity. Paid family medical leave provides Minnesota workers with up to 12 weeks of paid leave so that they can care for a family member with a serious health condition or bond with a newborn child. My family, like many others across Minnesota, owns a small business, and we can't afford to offer this kind of benefit to our employees on our own. We need this program in order to stay competitive with the large corporations and to provide our employees and families with the support they deserve. Earn sick and safe time gives Minnesota workers the ability to earn paid time off, to use when they're sick, or to take care of a sick family member for short periods of time. And we've seen the need for this amplified during the pandemic as people face challenges of COVID-19. Safe and affordable housing is another key issue we need to address. More than 580,000 Minnesota households pay more than 30% of their income on housing, which does not leave enough for necessities. A lack of housing affects all kinds of families, but especially those with low income. Stable housing is, a crit is critical to the development of children and to the ability of workers to hold jobs. Additionally, we need to make smart investments in broadband. Access to robust broadband is now recognized as a critical factor in the economic and social sustainability of all Minnesota communities. And we saw that more than ever during this pandemic. And yet an estimated 14,500 homes and businesses will go unserved in the next two years after Senate Republicans reduce the funding to broadband grants. Without reliable internet, our students will struggle to learn, working families find it hard to connect, and farmers all across the state struggle to modernize their businesses to stay competitive. Finally, Minnesota strives to be a state where our elders and people with disabilities have the support they need to live in a manner consistent with their wishes. We need to expand critical investments into older adult and disability services to make sure that people in these populations and those who care for them are safe, supported, and have an active role in decisions impacting their lives. By making these critical investments in our communities, we will truly be creating a better Minnesota where all Minnesotans can thrive. I will now turn it over to Senator Chuck Weger. Thank you, Senator Port, for your inspiring message. I'm Chuck Weger. I'm the ranking member for the Senate Education, Finance, and Policy Committee. This past year, our students, our parents and staff have faced incredible challenges with the pandemic. Our goal is for students to return to school and that the return be safe for students and staff. Thankfully, that is happening. Most elementary schools are now open. Several middle and high schools are open as well. And stay tuned. All of them are going to be open at some point, hopefully soon. As this happens, we need to make sure that the academic and non-academic needs of students are being addressed so they can thrive. The Senate DFL is committed that each student be on a path for success. Each child, regardless of race, zip code, or economic status, is de deserving of an opportunity in early education opportunities through post-secondary opportunities. This is the path for eventual hope and for success, and everyone deserves this. The bottom line, we must prioritize investing in our students and our schools, carefully providing and planting seeds, resources now, has a direct impact on their future success at harvest. As schools safely reopen, we must close the opportunity gaps that children face. We must address the mental health needs. These were pre-COVID issues and have only been exacerbated through this. We unfortunately are near the bottom of the nation in the counselor ratio. The DFL has fought for years to improve this situation. And most of these attempts have been thwarted by the Republicans. We will continue to offer solutions to address 
the mental health needs with more counselors, nurses, social workers, and other parts of the team at the schools who are doing heroic efforts during the pandemic and as we safely return. But we must do more to invest in the whole child. As a part of our strategy, we fully support the full service community schools. This is a proven evidence-based way to close the achievement gap, to provide opportunities. Ed Minnesota through their research, EPIC has demonstrated the opportunity gap will close if students can be provided some wraparound services in schools. The mental health needs, we have to continue to address those. And there are a variety of ways to approach the closing of the opportunity gap in one important way that we value and we want to invest in is to increase the number of teachers of color and indigenous teachers. 35% of Minnesota students are non-white. However, only 4% of the teachers. It's proven in research that students will do better if there's a high quality teacher that looks like them, that can relate better to them. The evidence is clear. Let's do it. We have a Teachers of Color and Indigenous teacher proposal, and there is some bipartisan support on that, but we need to invest the resources. Finally, the post-secondary opportunities for students. We need to ensure that programs are accessible and affordable. The training must align with the needs of our 21st century workforce. In summary, investing in education, students and our schools is crucial. By providing needed resources and programs, all Minnesota students, every child, will be on a path for hope and success. Please always remember, students are our future. I'll now turn to Senator Torres Ray. Thank you. Senator Torres Ray, you're on mute. Thank you so much. Thank you, Senator Weger. Good morning, everyone. I am Patricia Torres Ray, and I am the ranking member of the Environment and Natural Resources Finance Committee. Minnesotans know that we must come together to take bold actions against the existential threat of climate change. Invest in clean energy and guarantee a clean air and water for future generations in Minnesota and our country. Our children and our grandchildren are counting on us to take action now, not down the road. This is an opportunity to create good paying jobs, innovate and make Minnesota a leader. In doing so, we will make clean energy economy, a clean energy economy that works for everyone and make environmental justice a core value in all decision-making. Far too long, corporations have chosen to profit from harming our climate and at the expense of every small business and an average citizen. We know we need to take bold action together to create clean, a clean energy future with healthy communities, a healthy climate, and meaningful and dignified work for working Minnesotans. This bright future is possible for all of us if we right now enact the solutions available to us with the urgency that they deserve. Minnesota must do its share to reduce carbon emissions with, renew with a renewable energy of 100% by 2040. That is what we propose. Access to clean air and water is a fundamental right. No one, regardless of race, income, or zip code, 
should have to experience preventable health risks from breathing polluted air or drink unsafe water. Yet communities of color, indigenous people and low income communities pay the highest price for pollution and face the worst effects of climate change. From lead in the water to toxic air, we must take urgent and real action to keep all Minnesotans safe from pollution. We, the DFLers, will continue to fight for clean car standards that will reduce emissions and protect Minnesotans from air pollution in every corner of the state. Republicans have blocked many of our efforts. Last session, they block our effort to ban toxic chemicals, combat climate change, expand protections for wildlife, prevent road salt contamination, and ban the use of harmful insecticides. Minnesotans deserve better, and we must take action towards a clean energy future. Let's build an efficient electric vehicle infrastructure that will create good paying jobs reduce carbon emissions, and boost the economy across the state, particularly in Minnesota's rural electric cooperatives. More than 61,000 Minnesotans work in clean energy, with 40% of these jobs in greater Minnesota. There are opportunities to invest in transportation infrastructure, create jobs, and reduce pollution. We need to connect people to opportunities to improve their lives while caring for the environment. We need to set our state on a sustainable path that will rebuild our economy for the future. And now I will turn it over to Senator Jim Carlson. Thank you, Senator Torres Ray. I'm Jim Carlson and I'm the ranking member on the state government finance and policy and elections committee. Protecting our democracy is one of the most important jobs before us. The Senate DFL is committed to expanding citizen access to voting, advocating for policies and empowering citizens to participate in the political process. Expanding mail-in and absentee voting, uh, voter pre-registration, early voting and restoring the vote are vital reforms that will uh, ensure all eligible Minnesotans have access to the ballot. While the DFL has been fighting for equitable, free, and fair access to elections, Republicans seek to suppress the vote and sow doubt in our robust and well-tested election systems. To suppress the vote, the majority is pushing forward a bill to require photo IDs and implement a provisional ballot system. Photo ID, as you remember, was defeated in a statewide vote by Minnesotans in 2012. A costly provisional ballot system would not only eliminate our popular same-day uh, registration system, but the extra steps would make it harder for people to vote, particularly in greater Minnesota, elderly voters, underserved communities, and the poor. By protecting democracy for people and rejecting the disinformation, we put ourselves on a path to acknowledge the truth, to acknowledge voter access, and our First Amendment rights are paramount to whom we are as a nation. Minnesota has a strong history of election integrity, and we boast one of the highest voter turnouts in the nation. Our election administrators are well-trained and take their jobs very seriously. Through robust checks of, our, of voter eligibility and verification, paper ballots, comprehensive election audits by county officials, and Minnesota's election systems remain trustworthy and secure. When Republican leaders question our free and fair elections, they misinform voters and set us on a dangerous path with rippling effects throughout our communities. Our elections and our democracy can only remain free and fair for Minnesotans if they're represented fairly. The legislature, this legislature, is charged with the profound responsibility of redistricting prior to the 2022 elections. DFLers will do our part to ensure fair, representative and transparent redistricting guided by fairness and facts and not by partisan agendas. And now I will turn it over to Senator Fritz. Well, thank you very much, Senator Carlson, and thanks everyone for joining us. I'm Nick Frentz, Assistant Minority Leader and Ranking Member on the Senate Energy and Utility Policy and Finance Committee. 
I want to thank all of the colleagues on this call. I'm a proud Senate DFL member, proud to be in a caucus that represents all three of the state's main regions, urban, suburban, and greater Minnesota. And what I'm especially proud of is that the Senate DFL is for working families, for working men and women, for jobs, and for equality, racial equality, gender equality, and mostly equality of opportunity. You've heard many of our priorities here, and we want to have this be our opportunity to tell you what the DFL Senate has stood for and what we're planning to stand for and fight for as we get going forward. Are you a working family? Good. We support tax breaks for you. We support child care. We support health care. With time, you will get a chance to hear more about the individual bills we plan to bring forward, and you'll be proud of them and what they mean for everyday Minnesotans. Do you want your family to be safe from the virus? Good, so do we. We have consistently supported measures that promote public safety and worked with Governor Walz to try to find a path to allow Minnesotans to avoid being infected. Look at the numbers as we compare ourselves to our neighbors. Look at the mortality rate of the state of Minnesota when compared to our neighbors, North and South Dakota or Iowa. If we had the same fatality rate from COVID as our neighbors to the West, we would have had to live through 4,000 or more Minnesota additional funerals. That's what the Senate DFL did not want to see happen. And that's why we fought for public safety. It is government's duty to protect its citizens. Do you want education? So do we. We want to have a safe return to schools and we want to work on the things that are important to all Minnesotans. The achievement gap, teachers of color, and proper resources for our schools. If you want education to be a priority, then put your money where your mouth is. Minnesota has consistently prospered through its excellent school funding. We need to continue that. Do you want to fight climate change? I think your choice there of caucuses is quite clear. Our caucus is prepared to bring forth legislation not only to move us to 100% energy generation by 2040, but to make it a priority to do our share to reduce carbon emissions in industry, in transportation, and yes, in energy. And we are looking forward to it. Finally, all the things you've heard about here for DFL Senate priorities are things that everyday Minnesotans can stand behind, and we are ready to work together collaboratively, bipartisanly with any legislator that wants to see Minnesota move forward. Working families, housing, broadband, equity, our clean energy economy, and a firm commitment to democracy and the truth. Any lies, misinformation, or legislation that threatens our democracy has to be called out and exposed. I look very much forward to working with all of you and with the communities and cities and townships that make our state great. And with that, I'm going to say thank you again and turn it back to my colleague, Senator Susan Kent. Thank you, Senator Frentz, and uh, to all my colleagues. Um, so as I said, we are excited to uh, uh, announce these priorities and happy to answer any questions that you may have. All right. Well, thank you. Oh, John Croman. Yes. Have a question. Yes, John Croman. Uh, I know this isn't really on the topic of priorities, but just any comments you'd like to make just about uh, what appeared to be kind of like an attack on Minneapolis uh, in the uh, in the debate the other day. Um, just how do you how do you get across? Kind of the difference between what the city council in Minneapolis did versus what's good for the people who live in this city. This is um, this is another example of Senate Republicans trying to uh, use legislative and their le legislation and their legislative agenda to be divisive, to try to score political points, and to try to turn us against each other. Um, you know, without getting too much in the weeds of local government aid, which can get weedy really fast, um, their proposal is risky for all communities, but they're doing it under the guise of somehow punishing Minneapolis. We should not be punishing any Minnesota city. We should be trying to work together to make sure that we are creating um, all of our policies to help support Minnesotans wherever they live, 
As Senator French said, we have members in Minneapolis and St. Paul in our suburbs and across greater Minnesota in the Minnesota Senate DFL caucus. And that's what we're focused on. And um, we just, we need to be better than that. I thought that was a very uh, disappointing conversation um, started by that, uh, that um, effort that was very dishonest in its, in the message um, and, and the, the, just the very premise about the way mutual aid works. And uh, mutual aid is something that's good. It's something that Minnesotans do well. And our Minnesota communities do that. We're there for each other and we need to do that m moving forward. I had seen Eric's hand up. Say, Madam Leader, uh, how much of this is funding, in, increased funding for status quo programs, and how much of the funding is for new approaches to these various needs? That's a good question. Honestly, we have not um, quantified it in that exact way. It's, um, you know, as we've said, we need to make sure that, um, as, as many of you know, we don't have inflation built into our budget, and we do have a deficit, so we need to make sure that um, as we plan ahead for the next two years, that we're not making cuts in vital services, including education, including seniors, people with disabilities, veterans, um, th that they need us more than ever right now, frankly, because of COVID. Uh, and we know that there were problems that needed to be addressed before COVID that it's abundantly clear now, even more so that we need to. Um, Senator Weger, because education is a big part of this, do you want to chime in? Yes. Um, thank you, Leader Kent. Uh, the governor has put together a great plan, the Due North plan, where it provides the inspiration for how we're going to recover from the pandemic, which is very real yet. And just as we had a Marshall Plan uh, way back and recovering from battle and what we've experienced, w w the governor has pointed to the need to invest in, in addressing mental health needs for students. And there's a, uh, approximately $750 million to do that. But he also provides a way of paying for it. Uh, we have offered initiatives that uh, support this. And as well, I'm the chief author of Senate File 64, which has not been heard, but provides opportunities for uh, reading core, math core, full service community schools, uh, a number of opportunities that local school districts, that staff, that parents have said they'd like to see. So, you know, the, the governor has put approximately 750 million in the budget. Uh, I support that uh, and, and you know, let's hope that we'll get there. And also that we will get uh, some assistance in part two from the federal government. And I believe that's coming. Uh, Senator Weaker, does that include uh, getting rid of uh, last hired, first fired to better retain teachers of color? No. And then, Madam Leader, one more quick one. Um, yep. Transport. Why isn't transportation, roads, and transit a priority? Well, we put transportation in there as a priority. Um, it has been a priority for the Senate DFL for a number of years, and we have supported um, robust, uh, comprehensive, and sustainable transportation funding um, for years. Uh, we know it's important um, to make sure that people have access to transportation, which gives them access to education and jobs and housing. Um, we also know it's good for our economy and our businesses, and that's why the business community has supported it. Um, but we also know that um, you know, it, it, it isn't something that uh, the, the Senate Republicans have wanted to confront in an honest way in terms of the math of it. Um, they want to act like we can just use a little bonding here and there to solve the problem, which we know is not realistic. Um, so it is a priority. We stated it as a priority, um, as it has been. It is, you know, given the, the realities of this um, session and where we know Senate Republicans are, um, you know, we know it's 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 going to be a, a tough battle, but there will be bills introduced and we support them. Thanks. John Croman, is your hand still up or did you have another question? No, I was typing an email and it accidentally raised my hand. Sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. I think we've all done that. And um, Shannon Lurkey had had a question and said, never mind, but I will say she uh, happy anniversary. I saw that she just celebrated her fifth anniversary uh, with Capital Report. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Any other questions? 
thank you all for being with us today and um, talk, listening to us share our views on these very important issues that affect all of us here in Minnesota. And we look forward to seeing you around the Capitol or virtually. Take care. To continue following these issues and more, watch legislative coverage Monday through Friday on the PBS Minnesota channel or visit our website, www.senate.mn/media.